Welcome back for our final session uh, of the afternoon and of the gathering um, prior to uh, our co closing lecture, which will start pretty close to 6.30. Uh, we're a little bit uh, off of the schedule, but I think we'll end up getting back on it um, but before the close of day. Uh, the, the final panel is entitled Commodities and Cultures. And I'm going to uh, invite Juanita Sundberg, who is a professor in the geography department here at UBC, to uh, introduce our speakers. Welcome, everybody, to this final panel, cultures, Commodities and Cultures. I'm going to follow the previous um, commentator's model of doing all the introductions at once, although kind of like giving each one their own special moment, but in the interests of time and moving back and forth, we'll just do, that, do it all at once. So our first speaker is Sasha Wellen, and she is an assistant professor of anthropology and, and women's studies, which I think is a great position to hold, to have those joint appointments um, at the University of Washington. And she got her PhD in 2006 at the University of California in Santa Cruz. And her interests are in, in gender and feminist ethnography and visual and expressive culture, which is what we'll see a lot about today. One thing that I wanted to mention about Sasha is uh, something that really touched me, which is a book that she's written about uh, the lives of her grandmother and great aunt and their different um, life stories uh, and experiences, as the book says, on their different paths in their quest to be independent women. Uh, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Karen Hebert. And she's an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology and the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University. And she got her PhD in, at the University of Michigan in 2008. Uh, she's a cultural anthropologist, and her research is very much interested in natural resource production and consumption. And her work is situated in communities that are very, that are very involved in that aspect, in resources, and uh, in the subarctic north, particularly in southwest Alaska. And she looks at the salmon industry historically and in the present. And our final speaker is um, Dr. Michael Hathaway, who I realized that we have some interesting uh, connections um, in time and space. Well, now they're in space. Previously, they were in time. Um, and he's a professor of, of anthropology. Uh, and he got his PhD at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. And you're at SFU, right? Yes, at SFU. It, and um, Michael is interested in social studies of science, in globalization, indigeneity, and critical studies of development and conservation. And we'll hear a bit about um, some of those different aspects of his work today uh, as he shows us his green bag, which you'll see a picture of. And he's published on something that's close to my heart, which is uh, conservation encounters, as I've called them, and as he calls them, global environmental encounters. Um, and his work is situated in China. So welcome to our speakers, and yes, we're excited about your talk. Hi, thanks um, Juanita for the introduction. Thanks to Neil for the invitation and thanks to all of you who have lasted with us all the way to the very end. Um, I'm gonna start by just reading a bit about my research um, to try to explain how I get to my object. Um, during the first years of the new millennium in Beijing, my ethnographic research focused on the role of artists in China's bid to link tracks with the world, which was the official phrase at the time. 
In 2001, China's entry into the WTO, successful bid for the 2008 Olympics, and the first time qualification of a national soccer team for the World Cup, briefly gave rise to the phrase Ru Shi, or to enter the world. The sought after goal suddenly seemed within grasp. I followed artists and their interlocutors from art classrooms to cramped apartment studios to an expanding number of local exhibition spaces through a city that many likened to a massive construction zone. The artists I came to know spent their time weighing these changes while trying to craft a space for themselves within a landscape of physical and social transformation. Their paths through the city mapped a network that extended in new ways to other parts of China and the world. Their paths also led me to the object that I present today, the architectural model, which helped me understand the multiple encounters across national and rural urban divides, particularly those between artists, architects, urban planners, real estate developers, and rural migrant workers that occur in and shape the field of Chinese contemporary art. Um, Chinese contemporary art, is, as it's often narrated when it's exhibited in Western um, exhibit spaces is um, a much neater project when it ends up on the white wall of the museum that doesn't see the activity of all of these other people who are involved in it. And there are usually narratives that surround it um, about China becoming more like us or I'll get to some of those as we, as we go along. Um, so today I aim primarily to tell a story of these encounters that pivots around my object. So this is the object or one one um, example of the architectural model, which uh, will appear in my presentation both in two and three dimensional form, which depicts a future vision of Beijing as global city. And this image, this model, uh, this type of projection became increasingly ubiqu ubiquitous in the early years of the 21st century. On Billboards and vinyl backdrops plastered all over the city, um, often surrounding construction site scaffolding. Um, oh, I'm missing an image. Okay, a little bit out of order. Um, and in advertisements for new commodity housing. Um, this is actually a clip from a documentary film that I helped work on. Um, and we, this is a woman who's, um, you can see across the street, the dumpling shops are about to be demolished. Um, her, uh, she is a laid off factory worker who uh, hires rural migrant women whose Partners often are working on construction sites nearby um, to work in a hair salon that she runs out of the front of her house, which is about to be torn down, and she's sort of waxing uh, angrily about these flyers that are circulating about these new commodity apartments that you can have. And so this term commodity apartment or commodity housing is actually a very new term in China at this time um, because most people prior to this receive their housing through um, their work units through the social estate. Um, and the uh, architectural model also shows up um, very prominently in official plans for the national capital once they won the Olympic bid um, to make the national capital into this showcase uh, for the Olympics. And this included um, hiring of star architects um, like Rem Koolhaas, the Dutch architect who designed the Central China Television Tower, um, the French architect Paul Andreau who designed the National Center for Performing Arts, which ended up just down the street from Tiananmen Square, um, and then also uh, the Swiss firm Herzog and Demoran. These are just some of the most famous ones who designed the national stadium that was very famous in the Olympics as that bird's nest stadium. Um, so before the building of all of these things, the circulation of the images of what was to come was a kind of commodity form purchased by socialist, interestingly, by socialist state planners. Um, it is an object whose alluring sleekness and emptiness represents a dream world, a desire for social arrangements that would transcend existing forms. Um, it circulated at the same time as this Olympic motto of one world, one dream. Um, and this also signaled a hundred year old aspiration of China that was about coming out of their humiliation from the semi-colonial period when they were their treaty ports were chopped up between different Western um, and Japanese powers. Um, and so someone in the YMC, the Chinese YMCA, and I think it was about 1907, posed the questions then, when will Chinese athletes participate in the Olympic Games and when will we hold the Olympic Games? So about 100 years later, they finally achieved this. Um, the Chinese version of One World, One Dream is and there's something in there that doesn't quite get translated in the One World, which is which is the same 
world. We're going to be part of the same world now, which I think hints at kind of past stagings of the world of first and third world in which China was not seen as coeval. Um, so the architectural model is an object that catches up a range of social actors with um, discrepant transnational connections. Um, it's very contradictory. It incites national pride in this achievement at the same time that it produces many new types of social inequality. Um, and it's, I'm going to go back, I was out of order here. It's a dream world. Um, it's an object whose dream world power has material consequences. Um, the city is literally raised and rebuilt. Um, it becomes, in that moment, a construction zone of contestation. And this is just a detail from one artist that I worked with, Wang Neng Tao's um, photograph. It's a very large panoramic. This is just one detail of it. But this is literally what parts of Beijing looked like at this moment. It's just a huge, massive construction zone. Um, this what he titled this, I think it was 2001, this piece, Subversion of the Earth. Um, there's also examples like this piece by Wang Jingsong um, from 1999, 100 Signs of Demolition. Um, the full piece includes literally 100 signs. And this is the sign, the character um, to demolish, that it, when a house or a building is slated for demolition, they come by and they paint this on the outside of it. And there is an arbitration process by which people are uh, compensated. I think for, there are various schemes, sometimes by cubic square meter. Um, a cubic meter, um, but it was it it meant eviction, demolition of, of often from a, a home that you had lived in for quite a long time, and in the center of the city to be displaced very far outside, um, with the kinds of money that you would be compensated for the demo. And there was no choice in whether you're going to be demolished or not. Um, so it's interesting that artists are in this moment active observers and critics of the social changes that are literally turning over the city. Um, but state officials attempt to rebrand the national capital via culture reverses what was previously an antagonistic relationship between the state and artists who were considered avant-garde in some way. Um, and at this moment, their image-making skills are now suddenly enlisted to help make tracks with the world in a way that produces many deep ambivalences for them. And I won't go into all of it, but there are several very well-known artists who were previously considered dissident or exiled, who were some of the, created the fireworks shows and things like that for the Olympics. So they really are brought into the heart of it. Um, I want to go back to a do a little bit of back history just to um, say that this is not, this is just the most recent of debates over the built environment of Beijing as a cultural symbol of China's place in the world. Um, after the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, after the defeat of the Japanese in the Sino Japanese War and the defeat of the Kuomintang um, in the Civil War, um, various plans emerged at that moment for how to remake Beijing as symbolic capital of the new nation. Um, very famously, architect uh, Liang, Liang Xiecheng advocated for a conservation-oriented proposal in which the historical city would be left intact with public gardens created on top of the stone wall enclosing it. It was a walled city um, and an administrative center built to the west of old Beijing. Um, However, Soviet specialist and Western-trained urban planners influenced by a modernist aesthetic presented an opposing plan, which eventually prevailed. And that argued that the capital could only really realize its symbolic potential as the communist um, new nation by locating the capital in the center of traditional Beijing. So the city wall was by and large demolished at that time. This is just, there are very few remnants of it that remain. This is one of them that still remains. Um, and. Um, very famously, also, when Mao Zedong then stood at the top of the Gate of Heavenly Peace, which is the imperial palace, then turned into the center of the communist state, um, overlooking Tiananmen Square, he announced his hope that one day that this powerful vantage point would afford a view of hundreds of smokestacks as a symbol of China's industrial modernization. So that was the dream world of that moment. Um, so I want to flash forward now to 2007. So this is the moment before the Olympics. So most of these, a lot of these have not been built yet. Um, uh, this is uh, an ex uh, one of the many exhibits in the Beijing Urban Planning um, Exhibition Hall, which is just now on the southern edge of Tiananmen Square, so also located in this very important symbolic space in the city. Um, and it, narr it narrates, um, creates a narrative of the capital that leads from um, ancient grandeur, grandeur to the new Beijing of 2008, and I think very significantly um, largely skips over the Maoist period. There's just a very few small 
hints that that was something that went on for a while. Um, and then that this new Beijing um, was distinguished by the internationally designed architectural uh, monuments that would signify its arrival as a global player. So you can see, I think, the, the Rem Cool House, for those of you who might be familiar with the shape, um, that kind of upside down U, um, that's the Rem Cool House CCTV tower, which was not yet completed at the time that I took this photograph. Um, so the highlight of the museum I think, and for many of the viewers just watching them, is a two-scale map and model of the city um, with side exhibits like the one I just showed you, um, displaying impressive architectural projects under construction, especially the world, um, the Olympic stadiums and village. Um, and this museum, I think, encourages visitors to understand Beijing as a world metropolis that represents a, a China worthy of display. Um, and I just. I sort of, it was really just fun to watch people come and take their photographs, try to find on their, their where they lived, um, et cetera. Um, and then, so I want to move to sort of how real estate is, is part of all of this. Um, there is, for example, this exhibit in the museum of the interior of a new commodity apartment space, which was donated um, by the developers of Xiandai Cheng, which is a modern city, but the English name that's the branding of it is Soho. Um, and it's a, they're a real estate project, a very large real estate project. And this is like the interior, clearly a, a dream world. You can fall asleep and roses um, rotate around you. And then I've got a little film clip here of they literally have a movie going with the projection of the the Bird's Nest Stadium with the Olympics fireworks going over it that you can sort of sit in and, and imagine that you would live in this. Of course, very few people can live, afford to live in this kind of commodity housing of this sort of the Soho design. Um, but I think it extends whoops, the promise that urban dwellers can inhabit this artful space becoming part of the museum showcase of Beijing. And I just want to, by contrast, to say that this is a extremely different dream world or worlding than that of the 1950s, um, when artists' images such as this painting imaged China at the center of a socialist world that united Asia, Africa, and Latin America against a cowering gray U.S. clutching their atomic bomb. Um, I mean, part of the other iconography of this is in addition to the peoples of Asia, um, Africa, and Latin America um, united in arms is you have all of the different ethnic minorities of China arrayed in the background. Um, and that also this is in Tiananmen Square. Um, and that what you see in the background is the, um, the Great Hall of the People, which is one of the, the major Soviet um, monu monuments, monumental architecture um, works that, was, that were, was done at this point, point in time. Um, so I want to return now to the uh, idea of Showcase Beijing in 2007 um, to think about what um, Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet has described um, as the museum effect and how it works in, bo in two different ways. She says, not only do ordinary things become special when placed in museum settings, but also the museum experience itself becomes a model for experiencing life outside its walls. She continues, an ethnographic bell jar drops over the terrain. A neighborhood, village, or region becomes for all intents and purposes a living museum in situ. Um, and I want to say that this type of museum effect is at work in contemporary Beijing, such that certain people might explore the city um, as a museum of a disappearing past. But there's another kind also working. In Beijing, the museum effect also works to make residents who aspire to cosmopolitan parity with cities like New York see their homes as modern art objects, a future under construction in which China is recognized for those who can afford it as a place in the process of accumulating widely acknowledged forms of privilege and beauty. And for this, I want to turn to um, this idea that the museum itself serves as a kind of elevating metaphor or a brand in commodity housing projects to this project, which is the MoMA um, project, literally taking the Museum of Modern Art as its brand. Um, and it was designed by U.S. architect Stephen Hull. Um, and his idea of it, as you'll see, is a city within a city. Um, and this is, this is the MoMA um, model that I started with. Um, this is when my husband and I went, posed as um, potential customers, and we got the tour. So this is actually kind of like the Urban Planning Museum. They show you where on the map of Beijing you're located. Um, and then they also provide a lot of um, publicity materials, including a DVD. And so I'm going to just show a brief clip of Stephen Hull talking about his project. 
And notice he's talking in English and it's Chinese subtitles. So I'm, I need to speed up here. So I want to turn now to ask the question of what happens when this utopian, literally no place, linked up with the world worlding of China meets the ground. And so for this, I'm going to turn to the Ocean Paradise real estate development. I'm more familiar with this from my field work because it became, for a short period, a place where it was a new kind of exhibition space for contemporary artists. Um, so I want to start with this rendering, um, which is an architectural rendering um, that was purchased by the developers, but this was not what was built. So they paid a lot of money, actually, to the HOK architectural firm, um, and it was sort of one of those felicities of fieldwork. I am from St. Louis, which is the home office for HOK, so I was actually able, home at Christmas one year, to um, interview some of the architects, and they were actually deeply disappointed because they tried to include all these Chinese features in it, which were rejected, and in fact, the Chinese developers negotiated with HOK to have their relationship with the home office in St. Louis rather than their Shanghai our Tokyo office because they wanted to buy an American version of what real estate looked like. They didn't build this. They just bought an image that they could use as advertising. Um, they, um, the site was surrounded with um, billboards like this um, saying um, the WTO has arrived. Um, with this arrival, the opportunity to raise value has also arrived. Um, and what I want to say is the history of this site that within encircled within those billboards that this was um, a very important site for socialist China, where in the 1950s was um, three of the largest state-run textile um, factories, number one, number two, and number three cotton mills, which at the height of production employ employed approximately 8,000 workers, mostly of whom were female. Um, and the, as the state-owned enterprises diversify, they also then move into privatized, um, it's still the state, um, into privatized commodity housing. They tear down, they demolish um, the factories. Um, and I'm slightly getting ahead of myself again. Um, they hire young developers um, to then come up with a marketing plan of how to market the distinction for what they're going to do. And so one of the ideas is that some of the young staff who'd actually visited New York and seen this idea of the post-industrial Soho, that they would keep part of one of the factories as an art, as a art center in the center of this. Um, a side story is that these young people who thought that you know, they were envisioning the future were really shocked when they saw the workers who had worked here for most of their lives come to watch the demolition and just cry on the sidelines. Um, and they didn't know what to do with that. Um, so this is what the artists who are then said, there's a free space that you can use now. They're very excited about this. It's interesting because it's actually state space and they're being censored in a lot of the museums. Um, but what they choose to do in the opening exhibition is to create um, a series of pieces. This is a choreographer um, and a documentary filmmaker um, who they use the migrant rural workers who are building the new site. Um, they do pieces together with them about what it means for rural labor to be within China. This displeases largely the real estate developers because this is not exactly the image that they want to project. And it's not surprising that many of these kinds of art centers themselves within a couple of years are then demolished. It's a temporary moment. Um, so I want to go back now to Stephen Hall. He's talking about the cinema effect of his design. to talk about this kind of radical overlapping. What happens in the construction zone 
of cultural encounter um, is that there's I, what I see as a tension between different stagings of the world, our worldings. Um, and so this is one of the concepts I want to try to employ um, as a critical response to universalizing theories of globalization. And so I use that Stephen Hull um, that they, he has this cinema at the center of his design, but that the film that they choose to show in the promotional video is this film from the 1930s, um, Goddess, which is a silent film starring the magnificent Ranling Yu. Um, but what it's, it's, it's not iconic of what they're trying to represent. It's iconic of semi-colonial treaty port China. Um, and so it's sort of a rupture of a past worlding into the present one, because this is a story of a prostitute, the commodity of the city, transposed in this shot onto the city of Shanghai, um, who literally, um, at the end, ends up in prison. Her son is t uh, taken out of school when they find out that she's a prostitute. She kills the gambler who is sort of in control of her and has stolen all of her money, and she's put into prison. Um, so it's a weird thing that this shows up. There's more I could say. Um, so I want to turn now to um, artist Xing Dan Wen, who has used the architectural model, I think, in a different way. Um, in this series that she's done called Urban Fiction. Um, so she uses it to stage a related kind of violent interruption of the dream space. So I'm just going to zoom into the detail. This is what's happening um, inside there. Um, and to note also that previous to this series, that she was doing uh, a series of photographs like this, which were of the construction sites of rural migrant workers building these new urban fiction um, sites. Um, and then I will end um, by going now to the Rem Coolhouse CCTV tower to, to talk briefly about a different kind of eruption of a past worlding into the present one. Um, so here's the model. In the summer of 2007, um, and we, I, we, I just saw this as we were going by in a cab and stopped. So here it is going up, and you can see the old work unit housing that's here that is to be demolished to make way for that smooth, slick look of this. Um, but there were, at the time, um, we talked to the people who were just on the street there, um, three families that refused to move from the work unit building. Um, and they had covered the outside, this was quite amazing, of their building with anti-demolition and anti-government slogans. And the, the tenor and the language of it is using a kind of socialist language to condemn the government. Um, so it's, these are, say things like, the dark and feudal chi uh, Central China Television, which is the socialist broadcasting channel. Um, the Olympics are coming. I have no home. Um, the party has brought disaster to the people. CT CCTV officials have stolen the people's property. Is this legal? Um, it's an alliance of commercial and demolition officials. Um, and then we went back the next day. And you can see already they'd been painted over one time, the darker red beneath. And we went back the next day, and they had been painted over. Um, and so I'm very close to time, so I just want to end with this slide and a few methodological thoughts that this is one of those to demolish signs over which someone has painted um, protect. Um, so I'm thinking through Nathan's paper where people actually have much less, even than in Miami, ability to try to make claims to their, their spaces in the city. Um, just methodologically, a few things that I'm trying to think through is this idea of a zone of encounter that I borrow from um, fellow anthropologist Liba Faher um, and to think about, um, to use this to um, challenge the many kinds of oversimplifications in which Chinese contemporary art is read, that this idea of all of the different kinds of actors who are involved in order to make something that gets marked as very Chinese um, when it travels outside of China um, is, is very instructive to me. Um, it's, so the participants include artists and art professionals around, from around the world, as well as all these other kinds of actors who negotiate what counts as Chinese and what counts as art. Um, and that the artists, like what's happening on these sites, are also digging into different layers of history, of personal experience, of their training in institutions shaped by anti-colonial nationalism and socialism, and of specific visual technologies and references. And they do these kinds of archaeological excavations um, where there's these eruptions that come into the current dream story that they're being pulled into. I'm obviously really also using Susan Buck Morris's idea of dream world of mass utopia, which she uses as a way of thinking about the visual culture of East and West during the Cold War, and that actually those images are very similar in the ways that they're, they're just different utopic visions. Um, and that this helps me think about visual culture, the importance of it in producing these powerful imaginaries, but also in potentially unsettling them. And then I'm 
using all of this to try to develop the concept of worlding, which provides me a way to analyze the various and conflicting ways that world cultures have been hierarchically ordered, um, negotiations over China's shifting place in this cultural order of things, and how these stagings of global relations depend upon particular formulations of gender. I wasn't able to talk about that much today. Um, and that art matters in this case because it provides a nuanced understanding of globalization as a long-term heterogeneous process in which multiple worldings, each bearing the residue of different historical cultural encounters, in China's case, semi-colonial, socialist, neoliberal, and neocolonial, um, how these rub up against each other in art world social relations and the visual images they produce and circulate. Um, well, I get to thank Sasha for such a really fascinating paper, and there are obviously a lot of other people to thank as we near the end of the conference. Thanks to Juanita for being our commentator, and Neil, of course, uh, to UBC and the museum and the Musqueam First Nations, and um, of course to all of you for hanging in here until uh, this late stage in the game. So I guess I need this is. Uh, my object and my presentation, uh, which is entitled Quality Salmon. And uh, today I want to explore the encounters, exchanges, and travels through which quality salmon is brought into being as both a sort of technical and aesthetic commodity ideal, a sort of dream in the sense that uh, Sasha was using it, as well as a material body in the world. And obviously those two processes are very much uh, interrelated. Now specifically I want to do this by examining some of the peculiarities, challenges, and paradoxes of producing producing quality salmon um, in the rural southwest Alaskan fishing region of Bristol Bay, and often trying to produce quality salmon and, and not necessarily being able to, to realize that. And this actually highlights some different aspects of these processes than those that are uh, represented in the paper that, I, that I've posted. So there are some differences there. Now, I'm so happy to be able to talk about salmon in a place like Vancouver, because I know that people in Vancouver understand the um, overwhelming importance of salmon, and I'm really reminded of the way that Shawnee Casavant on our first evening here really reflected on this, and she described it as more than just the food, it's the center of our lives, and she offered this really amazing description of the significance it holds in its um, uh, preparation and distribution and the social relationships that surround it, and also what I found so striking is that she described the satisfaction that she and others find in sort of looking at it in, when it's jarred and um, seeing the flesh being just right. And um, her account, uh, this really moving account of salmon production that shares lots with um, you know, how this is done in southwest Alaska, reminds us that there are multiple ways of understanding what it means to have the flesh just right, or at least that's what I'm going to suggest here. Um, and in keeping this in mind, I, I want to explore you know, through how through a sort of variety of circulatory regimes, as uh, this sort of uh, term has been mobilized in the past few days, I want to uh, talk about how diverse practices and visions of quality are enjoined um, in the production of quality salmon, and then you know, think more about how we can understand this. So, um, to give you a sense of where I am going, as in a lot of the cases that we've heard discussed in the last few days, um, what we find here is not some sort of simple story of previously distinct cultures sort of banging into one another in conflict, but actually we find um, that an inordinate amount of work goes to making certain sorts of commensurabilities possible. Um, and this is only more evident in the case of the production of quality salmon because of the extraordinarily self-conscious efforts by producers and consumers alike to sort of incorporate attention to the pre presumed perspectives of others in this sort of commodity network into their own action and work. And this is uh, reminiscent of what Michelle Callan has talked about as, as a growing phenomenon of market reflexivity. Um, and Nevertheless, I, I want to both understand this as, a, as an important phenomenon that we should think about, but also um, 
sort of reveal the fact that a lot of the activity of this reflexivity and the heterogeneity of its character is ultimately obscured in the expression and transaction of something like quality salmon. And I guess in, in this respect, sort of the idea of the fetish is dancing around here, or I'm dancing around that, and maybe this is something we can talk more about um, in the questions. Now, before I, I focus on the particular sort of pathways of exchange that um, inform Bristol Bay salmon production, I want to just give some sense of the broad array of movements that inform the production of a commodity like this. And this, there's, we see this in multiple forms of travel. First and foremost, the travel of the salmon themselves. These are sockeye salmon coming back to Bristol Bay estuaries um, in order to, in their spawning phase. These, these uh, leave from these rivers and lakes go out across the North Pacific in areas that have been carved up by uh, international agreements involving sort of national fishing control. Um, another movement that's been really significant for uh, the global salmon industry as it is today is um, the movement of capital, uh, specifically from Norwegian aquaculture firms to production sites in Chile, like those we see here. Um, this is a gr what's called a grow-out site of an industrial aquaculture firm. Uh, to clarify, um, fish farming is illegal in Alaska, which sort of sets the background for a lot of what I'm going to tell you. And uh, here we see the fish are not caught. They're sucked directly in the tubes that you can see in the center of the frame here into the processing facility and, and made into forms that are sold, can be sold directly to consumers, like vacuum-sealed you know, dinner-sized portions and PBO fillets, which is an industry where it's pin bone out, so in, in, in you know, packages that are immediately ready to eat. Um, now, the, the sort of growth of operations like this have radically transformed salmon markets, and, and in fact, the actual physical salmon that we see in the world. This is, you can see in this, it, with, you know, this is farmed salmon, uh, this gray line we see here, and wild production in black. And you can see until, you know, well into, you know, the 80s, farmed salmon was a negligible fraction of total production until um, we see it just exponentially rise. This is a lot of what you see in the growth of Chilean production to, you know, surpass, uh, to surpass wild production in the mid-90s, and this, this line is only sort of continuing to soar. And I think, you know, you're, there's obviously now much more salmon in the world than there was, you know, 40 years ago, and, and um, most, the salmon is, is uh, the majority of it is, is farmed salmon. So these sort of ways of knowing and representing the industry, like we see here, are, are also formed in, in spaces like this one. Um, this is the uh, annual International Boston Seafood Show, and it's a space where expertise circulates through the interchanges that happen here, and where there are various sorts of intermediaries who are interacting to produce sort of um, knowledge and practice in, that inform um, uh, the, the seafood industry and, and salmon industry in particular. And um, the, the sort of discussions that happen here are also uh, manifest in the creation of sort of technologies and metrics for measurement that are enacted in um, processes of product certification, excuse me, that uh, are increasingly important uh, for the flow of seafood products and salmon products in particular. This is something that I consider elsewhere, but um, these are sort of, you know, these. The, the sort of parameters and designs that inform these are, uh, are created through a lot of these movements. Now, we also have um, not only the movements of ideas and practices, but the movements of actual people, and both from around um, rural Alaska and the U.S., the fleet that uh, is, works in Bristol Bay. Here you see um, drift uh, boats that are in the Dillingham, Alaska Harbor. I'll show you that later on. And uh, the workers here are a heterogeneous lot from many different locales including many uh, local people from the Bristol Bay region. And, and the workers in the processing plants are, um, are often uh, transnational laborers who come from uh, many different parts of the world. Um, and with them, they bring... Uh, you know, diverse histories and relationships to these fish and to one another and to their work that come to inform um, labor in the commercial industry. Now, increasingly, uh, the sites of all of these workers um, are set on other sorts of, you know, traveling and composite expressions of cosmopolitan taste. And these often touch down in spaces like this here, which are the shelves of a Whole Foods near you. Now, these um, 
you know, clearly what we see on the shelf here don't reflect just the proclivities of consumers, but are also informed by you know, retailers and structures of the supermarket industry. But, but they're often talked about and conceptualized as being sort of the, 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 the new sort of trends in consumer demand, which, which are, um, are located on this sort of space. And this, this, this space is so crucial for Alaska salmon producers because it's seen as sort of the site of industry salvation. Since it, the sort of the parallel graph to the one that I showed earlier with the rising aquaculture production was paralleled to a significant degree by falling prices for salmon generally and specifically for Alaska salmon. So uh, since the late 80s, early 90s, uh, the salmon industry in Alaska has fallen on extremely hard times. When I began my uh, research on this project in the early to mid 2000s the industry was at an all-time low and it was um, virtually insolvent and even though uh, it's it's you know profitability has improved somewhat near then it's um, it's still nothing compared to what it was you know in at different decades in the past and breaking into new markets like this one here is now seen as um, the way for the industry to um, to be able to sustain itself in in especially in, in uh, regions of rural Alaska now, um, producing fish like this, rather than sort of canned output and frozen, headed and gutted H&G, these new sort of packages, often fresh and frozen fillets, um, these are always talked about in terms of this notion of quality, producing quality salmon. And on one hand, you know, quality salmon refers to the whole range of positive attributes that we find on these shelves. So, you know, wild as opposed to farm salmon, socially and environmentally responsible, supporting family fishers and uh, coastal communities and even often indigenous people, uh, filled with omega-3s, wholesome and healthy. All of these positive attributes are associated with uh, quality salmon, but quality salmon in the, in the context of the salmon industry also has a much narrower meaning. And it generally re is, refers to sort of the absence of blemishes in the fish flesh. And so it's often talked about in terms of, you know, what it's not, which is what you see here. This would not be, it's, it's, this is trotted out to the, the, you know, the opposite of quality salmon. It has uh, bruising, which we can see here, which is a terrible quality killer. And we, it also has the separation of fish flesh known as gaping. And um, these are these are related to handling, or they, these can be mitigated against with certain handling practices like bleeding, chilling, and uh, sort of careful, gentle handling. So these uh, are what's talked about when, when and specifically when um, fishers and policymakers talk about promoting quality production. They basically are saying fish should be treated differently, so they, they are turned from something that looks like this into something that looks like this, this sort of image of fleshly perfection. So um, <laughs> now, the, the point is often made in a lot of these industry contexts, these sort of meetings and workshops and trade shows, that only fish that can look like this, you know, that can look quality in this narrow sense, can be sort of successfully marketed as quality in this broader vein, can appear on the shelves of Whole Foods. And this is, this is really clear when we look at like, branding initiatives, like this fledgling branding initiative in Bristol Bay. This, um, is an effort to sort of mark Bristol Bay fish with a seal like we see here. And in the seal would say Bristol Bay Wild, sustainable salmon from Alaska. But when we look at this, it's actually the cover of a pamphlet. And we look inside the pamphlet, we realize that it's not just any old fish from Bristol Bay that can be labeled like this. It's fish that, um, that you know, sort of meets a whole checklist of quality guarantees, which means that producers uh, have to be incorporating these aspects of sort of bleeding and chilling and gentle handling into their, into their production practices. Now, um, some, of these, some of these practices that are entailed here actually require changes to boats and fishing operations that can sometimes run in the tens of thousands of dollars, installing RSW systems, refrigerated seawater systems, for example. But in actuality, most, uh, the most salient changes involve um, ones that are shifts in, in, in orientation, attitude, and even the sort of bodily comportment of fishing work. And we see this very clearly if we look at this um, if we look at these, these are images from a, uh, 
an online training program for quality handling that's uh, produced by the state uh, seafood marketing agency. And we can see that both two different aspects of quality that I want to highlight here. First is that it's always um, that fishers are always encouraged, this is directed toward harvesters in particular, and they're always sort of um, directed towards thinking about end consumption, fishing with their own in, at, moments of fishing work with the sort of imagined end consumer in mind. And so when explaining why quality is important, it says seafood must exceed the expectations of the customer. So the customer and the consumer is always envisioned as really important, and, and they're explicitly oftentimes in various trainings urged to imagine this, this fish that you're holding as the object of somebody else's dinner plate down the line. And what that means in everyday practice is that um, there's a much more careful and attentive um, you know, understanding of both the fish itself and uh, fisher's own labor. So you can see here it says, treat fish gently, carefully place fish, do not throw, and minimize handling, handle fish by the head and, and not the tail. And what we see here is this heightened sense of delicacy of the salmon itself and the way they should be treated. And interestingly, see, this is reminiscent of Bourdieu's characterization of upper class food, which conveys, you know, a favoring of, of quality over quantity and a distance from necessity and different forms of aesthetic stylization, maybe not unlike these, you know, uh, apartment, the, the commodity housing in, in uh, Beijing. So um, this might seem like sort of simple changes to fishing practice, but in fact, it poses a host of challenges, especially in a place like Bristol Bay. Now, Bristol Bay, for those of you who don't know, is a major Alaskan fishing region, and it's located uh, just west of the Alaska Peninsula, which sort of extends down to form the Aleutian Chain. And I did most of my field work in the west side uh, hub community of Dillingham. And it's actually a paradigmatic place for cultural encounter. It's this region broadly is, is sort of the home of a number of different Alaska Native groups, um, Yupik Eskimo to the west, Denina Athabaskan, and Alutic Aleut. And it's also been, since the, um, since the presence of the commercial fishing industry since the late 1800s, it's um, been um, the site of a lot of migration into the region from not only Europeans and Euro-Americans, but also a wide variety of uh, cannery workers and other industry workers who hail from around the world. Uh, China, Japan, the Philippines, Latin America. Um, so it's a, it's a, the industry is certainly multi-ethnic, and the region is predominantly Alaska Native, but it's a, um, there, there's heritage represented um, from many different uh, places in the world. Now, um, it's also uh, the world's largest sockeye salmon producing region. And unlike many other stretches of the North Pacific, I'm sure very, you know, most of you are well aware, um, you know, where there are lots of struggling salmon runs, salmon in this region is actually, the populations are actually quite strong. And in fact, it's, it's, the volumes have almost become as a curse as much of a blessing in this industry. The season is incredibly compressed. The tens of millions of fish that return to this region every summer come in little over a two-week period, the, the bulk of them. And so there's manic sort of round-the-clock fishing which, with, with which this industry is associated. So on the one hand, this makes it extremely difficult to do the sort of um, careful handling practices that are presented as like a no-brainer by a lot of the you know, industry experts. And on the other hand, these, these volumes have created an industry ethos that's really celebratory of large volumes like we see here. So there's like a lot of sort of bravado associated with you know, catching lots of fish and treating them you know, really roughly in this case. I guess you see this is probably not, would not be you know, a quality directive, <laughs> you know, <this> to say. <laughs> and, um, and this is, uh, you know, this, is, it's, this has been sort of memorialized in boat names like cash flow and net income, where there's a direct sort of, you know, correlation between the amount of fish you catch and the, and the money that you get in return. Um, and it's exactly sort of, you know, these sort of, you know, bad attitudes, as they're often talked about by, uh, by industry consultants, are what's, are, what, are what's targeted for transformation in this industry. Um, now, so a lot of this focus on consumption is enlisted to sort of change fishers from, from treating fish in this way to, to, to a much more sort of delicate, uh, you know, 
bodily habitus, as I've described earlier. And this often involves this focus on consumption. Um, but interestingly, in this region, um, this, this effort to encourage fishers to envision and um, envision the consumer habits and reorient their work in order to produce for it both propels and subverts the promotion of quality production, I want to argue. And one site in which we see this especially apparent is um, at, uh, this is a workshop that I attended in the mid-2000s, and it was um, held by, excuse me, a rural um, development organization that was trying to help fishers get better prices for their salmon, and it was funded by grant money. A lot of residents from across the Bristol Bay region were able to fly in and attend, and, and they, were, they were excited about going. This was something that they volunteered to do. It, it was, the, the workshop stimulated a lot of interest, and it also flew in presenters. Everyone here is sort of listening attentively to presenters who were flown in from across the state, who included transportation specialists, marketing analysts, seafood processors, and rural development experts, all sort of sharing expertise and experience on, on how fishers might Im improve quality practices and um, cultivate entrepreneurial activities, and in general do a variety of things that would help sort of uh, increase uh, prices and profitability. Now, the fact that area residents you know, eat salmon you know, virtually every day in one form or another, whether it's smoked, dried, pickled, half-dried, I mean, there's like an infinite array of the way that people put up their salmon. Um, is um, it was something that that you know this this was a repeated recurring theme in this in this workshop, and the fact that these producers were were. Um, just, you know, really avid consumers of salmon um, made them, in many ways, more interested in pursuing quality production. They, they, when they spoke really impassionedly, they, they claimed to feel embarrassed and ashamed at times that they sold fish to processors that they wouldn't want to serve to friends, and they, they were excited about this idea of making products that appealed to consumers. Um, this was also seized upon by buyers. Um, the fact that, you know, fishers make their own home pack. They put up fish like this to dry, and it's often smoked in the summer. The scene is sort of ubiquitous in southwest Alaska. This, was, this idea was sort of seized upon by, um, by, uh, by processing uh, managers um, who often sort of use this image to encourage uh, their commercial fishers to to um, produce for their consumers as if they were making their own home pack. Um, and so one processor talked about how he encouraged a home pack mentality, to take the care as if you were doing this for your family and friends and relatives. Um, however, you know, the home pack that fishers make for themselves doesn't always neatly map onto the products that these distant others are said to demand. You know, for example, there's almost an obsessive elimination of bones, skin, and grease in these, um, in these quality products packages, and these are some of the same features that are prized by area residents. I mean, the head, for instance, you know, it's, it's so typical half the time in these so-called white tablecloth restaurants where um, this fish is often sold, the head is, n is never present, and in fact, sometimes if there is a head on fish, I don't know if any of you have experienced it, they'll warn you in advance. Okay, thanks. Um, whereas, you know, fish head soup is the, you know, the, the favorite food of, of half the, you know, people I knew in southwest Alaska. So um, I want to also just quickly, I'm being pushed to uh, finish up, and I wanted to um, just direct our attention to another example of, uh, of a moment when this disjuncture was, was manifest. This was when um, workshop presenters on the second day for lunch, too bad we did not get this for our lunch, um, were where they, the presenters actually brought along quality salmon products to both expose producers to the kind of products that they were increasingly urged to, to produce for, as well as actually then it became to get feedback on these products that they could then use. So it was like a sort of uh, you know, ready-made focus group for them. And they said, you know, who would know more about these products than Bristol Bay fishermen themselves, people whose lives are you know, completely intertwined with fish? And um, after this sort of sampling event, the, this, you know, the group reconvened and you know, started to talk really animatedly about all the sort of intricacies of texture and taste and how to describe 
these products that they had sampled. And um, one, uh, one fisher was sort of midway through, a, through a, a sort of evaluation of these salmon patties, which most people at the workshop thought were way too dry. And she stopped herself in the middle and she said, but, you know, I don't know if, you know, you know anyone here, we have different tastes. You know, we like a native food. We love it when the grease is sort of rolling down our chins. And it, they often invoke this, uh, you know, even the industry experts themselves, this sort of ideal type customer, which is a housewife in Peoria. You know, we don't really know what the housewife in Peoria looks like when she, when, you know, when she wants her food. So um, I share this example in closing um, to say that, you know, Bristol Bay Fisher's own consumer identities are articulated through expressions of both likeness and difference, sort of shared sensibility with and as consumers alongside of assert, uh, assertions of alterity stemming from culture, uh, place, and class. And we, we see this really evident um, in the fact that, you know, these, a lot of the salmon products that um, are produced, for example, these salmon strips drying here, which you can see the grease sort of condensing on the ends, you know, these, it, it was not lost to people at the workshop that these are exactly the kind of products that it's actually, despite the sort of rhetoric surrounding the appreciation of traditional preparation methods, it's impossible to sell these uh, things produced this way commercially because they are not cooked at a high enough heat, even when smoked, um, to be able to be eligible, you know, for federal food stand, uh, quality standards. Um, so uh, I just want to quickly uh, give one suggestion that um that even though oftentimes quality production sort of depends on all of these you know, heterogeneous forms of work that are enlisted to produce it, uh, these are exactly what's not present in the sort of quality product itself. And so when we see something like this, uh, it's sort of stripped away. The, these production practices are most successful when, um, when it seems that this fish is not mediated at all. If, and, and it's oftentimes in the advertising talked about is you know, fish that jumps straight from the sea onto the dinner plate, and that's the idea, um, sort of, and, and what we get here is, you know, nature that would seem to spring forth unmediated, but is in fact, you know, a product of labor that's remade in an image of nature that's infor informed in large part by uh, the practices of industrial aquaculture. So um, I will end there and um, pass it along to my Michael Hathaway. And I wanted to yeah, thank everybody that's been attending, that's been giving talks, has been participating, especially Neil for pulling all of this together, bringing us all here for these, in our own itineraries of exchange. Here, and actually, that is a photo of the bag, but I brought my bag. It's not a boat, it's not, it's not this model that couldn't be brought on the plane um, from Beijing. But I wanted to talk about this bag that, you know, ostensibly it has very little value. Um, nobody really even noticed it, you know, me kind of um, bringing it here. And it doesn't have much uh, kind of potential marketability in international sales in the ways that things we've talked about, like, you know, refer to shrunken heads or Islamic manuscripts or enslaved bodies. It's just a kind of cheap commodity, right, in a way. But this, this bag was not even meant to be sold. It was meant to be given away to uh, uh, ethnic Tibetan women like this in upper northwest uh, Yunnan, which is in southwest China. And also in a, in a similar way to um, what Karen was just talking about, it's part of a larger kind of attempt to reform her practices, her relationships with the mushroom and bringing it um, along. So the bag itself, it has very little kind of meaning, very little uh, value, but the value is what's inside it. And the meaning, as I'll talk a little bit about, is also encoded on these lists of rules and regulations that are stamped here and that are um, authorized by the Yunnan Provincial uh, Customs that um, also uh, talks about, uh, kind of infers threats of, of sanctions against people who do not follow these protocols. So this is a, a very special bag, and it's a bag not just for mushroom hunting, right? It's not just for mushrooms at large, but it's all intended for one kind of mushroom. And what's interesting for this in a Chinese setting, too, is that a lot of times these people who are out to gather them or even that are involved in this long commodity chain don't particularly like the matsutake. It's not a particularly uh, desired mushroom. And I think that this bag probably will be repurposed. I mean, it definitely won't be used according to protocol. But I don't know if the term, some of the terms we've used earlier, uh, these terms of appropriation, 
or these terms of resistance or um, or otherwise will be you know applicable to this bag. But I'd like to talk about this bag as a special object that is based on a kind of global exchange to think about the question of commodification and about the specific relationships between consumers and producers. All right, put my bag on. So this is a wild mushroom, and for those that don't know this incredible mushroom, some people call it the truffle of Japan. And uh, the one that she has right here is a bit old, but some of the other ones back there are a bit more valuable. And at its prime, uh, this can reach uh, values of greater than $1,000 a kilogram. So sometimes fortunes have been made in one day, including um, in British Columbia. So, and it's a mushroom that really has my respect because it's a mushroom that for decades has avoided cultivation. Okay, we've been able to cultivate all these other kind of wild things or aquaculture things, but Matsutake has bested the best of scientists around the world working around the clock. Uh, when I was in Japan, uh, last time there were headline news of Matsutake finally grown in the lab and everybody was so excited and then a few weeks later said no. This is, you know, this is another kind of false al alert and this has happened year after year after year so you know, don't get your hopes up. Um, and you know, who's to know how this will change how it works as a global commodity. Um, and I wanted to say today that my work with this mushroom is just beginning. Um, and thus my comments are really provisional, but I'm really interested not only in the commercial movements of this mushroom, but which are often uh, in, the, sorry, in this area on the uh, high Tibetan plateau in China where I do fieldwork, and it, looking at its sales to urban Japan in particular, but also I'm really interested in the mushroom itself and its necessary relationships with host trees that it needs, with insects and forest mammals that are uh, deeply important in its growth and probably its movement through space. And it's also stimulated many conversations with people that work in the massive transnational networks of commerce, of science, and of bureaucracy that revolve around or sometimes just intersect with this mushroom. There are people who hunt it in the woods, who ship it on trucks and planes, who study it in the lab, who sell it to wealthy businessmen, who just sometimes pick one up and eat it raw in the woods or, or have it served at a fancy restaurant, the white tablecloth restaurants with thousand dollar wine, and those who regulate its commerce or demand its conservation and management. Um, and uh, recently, before I went to China the last time to look at the Matsutake, it was declared an endangered species, which set up a whole other set of questions and concerns around its potential marketability and movement. So I wonder sometimes, um, there's something that some people that collect the mushroom that, and that, uh, I was going to say worship the mushroom, but who research the mushroom, uh, what sometimes they call Matsutake fever, um, and that it kind of possesses, and I feel like that I might be um, victim of that, yes, okay, it's happening here. Um, so it's not just me, and uh, so this is part of this larger uh, project um, that we're doing that we're calling the Matsutake World's Research Group, and it's mostly, you can see, mostly uh, West Coast with uh, Toronto um, also as the kind of outlier in there. This uh, group of people, and it also there's some intersections with, um, there's Liba who uh, Sasha just mentioned and, and um, some other people. And, you know, as you know, a lot of you are historians or anthropologists or otherwise, it's often difficult to have collaborations. And Chris Lee uh, talked about his brave new ventures in interdisciplinary collaborations. Luckily, we're all anthropologists. That makes it a lot easier in some ways. But so with this group of people, we, we've all done field work in different sites. We have different linguistic capacities. Um, but one thing that we do share is uh, a, a really uh, strong interest um, in coming together around Matsutake to meet once or twice a year to go to each other's field sites and to kind of act as guests and hosts in them. And it, it allows us to, like when I go to Japan, to ask the really stupid questions that my, you know, that my Japanese colleagues cannot ask. Um, and likewise, wh um, when I'm in China and bringing people there. And, but one of the things that draws us together, the Matsutake and certain kinds of theoretical questions and interests so uh, particularly around cultural encounter, human, non-human relationships, commodities, and the production of transnational scientific knowledge. Um, something I won't talk about uh, today, but something that's of great interest. 
Um, so often one of us will work in, and uh, work in a certain site and then someone else will come in later. Um, later I'll be going to the Pacific Northwest and we're having some emerging uh, work that's coming in Vancouver and then hopefully on Vancouver Island and some of the other places because this is also you know, one of the key spots in, in the world. Um, and what we're really interested in is the kinds of unique social worlds that are engendered by this valuable mushroom. So by which we mean the changing configurations, not only the mushrooms, the mushroom hunters, the dealers, but also laws as they are shaped and shifted, property rights and claims, uh, the reconfiguration of ethnic hierarchies and so forth. Okay. So the rise of Matsutake as a global commodity. I'm sorry, these mushrooms are a little bit small here, but this is a uh, direction much bigger in real life. So this is the late 1990s here, right? And uh, oh, actually, I've got a pointer. I can do that. Okay. So if we were to look, if we were to do this map earlier here, it would have only been right around there. It would have only been in Japan. That would have been the only kind of serious, um, uh, kind of regularized, uh, commodified uh, space for the hunting and distribution and you know, consumption of these mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, there, were, there have been attempts um, over time earlier, especially on the Pacific Northwest Coast, there were Japanese immigrants who would often ship these back to their kin and rela you know, their relatives in Japan, but they said they'd often just arrive as a pile of you know, kind of mush and a few worms. Um, so it took uh, different kinds of circuits of exchange to make these possible. So sometime between World War II and the 1980s, the Matsutake supplies in Japan really became a dwindle. It used to be a great pleasure to go to the woods and, and, and collect these mushrooms, but they, they became less and less. And the story is really unclear, but around the 1980s, as the supplies domestically diminished, uh, Japanese dealers went throughout the world to try to find uh, Matsutake. Um, and it's not something, it's interesting, that people just automatically tend to enjoy. It's not a kind of more neutral commodity like rice that has such a, you know, a strong, uh, such a strong interest around the world. Or it's also not something that is so easily become something once seen as incredibly idiosyncratically Japanese, but has become a part of global cuisine like, like sushi. Um, it, it's, um, it's something that a lot of people are often um, quite resistant to. Like in China, for example, the people I talked to said they'd occasionally put it in the stew, but it would just thicken the stew. And if they had tofu, that would be better. So it was a, my son said it's a tofu substitute, which is kind of interesting because usually you think of tofu is substituting the other way for everything else in the world. Um, but the office said it's not as good. But if we look at Sweden, um, so that's another uh, uh, site too that's, that's emerging up here in Scandinavia. So when Linnaeus was kind of grappling with this question of how does he name this, how does he bring this into the scientific uh, community, he uh, asked a number of his fellow colleagues about, about the, the, the kind of matsutake that they have there, and they all found the odor just so uh, disgusting that he gave it the permanent Latin name in that area, which is nasalium, that which makes one nauseous. Um, so it doesn't have a lot of you know, cachet as an, as, as an obvious valuable commodity throughout the world, and that's part of what makes it so um, fascinating. But by the 90s, uh, you know, these, uh, these countries, uh, here, you know, in Morocco, um, up in Scandinavia, Finland, Bhutan, you know, Canada, U.S., uh, Mexico, they all became part of this new emerging global network. And I think there's something that, where was Jessica over there, um, alluded to in, a, in the earlier uh, days that she's talking about the questions about commodities and the ongoing global encounter leave much to be explored. And uh, I think some of the key frames historically for, for thinking about this include world system theory with its concepts of core and periphery and center and metropole. And in one way, this Japanese case seems quite like this, but switching it away from a kind of often European or North American center. Um, there's much recent work that takes a less deterministic approach and it looks at this exchange in a more dialectical process about how mutual world making is an ongoing process that's both conceptual material. And one, one example that um, I was thinking about with, um, with her talk included uh, Jeremy Presthold's book, Domesticating the World, which looks at how East Africans 
purchasing power and particular consumer desires reshaped the factories and work habits of European industry. I'm particularly talking about cloth and beads. It's a fabulous book. Um, and other less bipolar approaches include a commodity chain analysis, which, you know, as everyone knows, is following an object from its kind of beginning to its, to its end, to its consumption. And while useful, some describe this, this as a kind of theory-free method, while others complain that it might be quote, theoretically promiscuous, um, for whatever that means in its way. Um, but as part of the Matsutake World's Research Group, we use this method of commodity chain, but we ask different kinds of questions that are typically asked. Um, and, and we're wondering about how the ways in which particular commodities shape and are shaped by the specific cultural milieus in which they are created, in which they are distributed and consumed, and also that, that kind of that relationship of, of, of shaping these milieus themselves. So we're interested not only in the kind of singular chains formed by individuals and organizations, but also the kinds of networks that emerge around this commodity, this organism, this gift, and this object of scientific inquiry. Okay, so to return to this mushroom bag, which is very much about this kind of bilateral trade between China and Japan, uh, one could think about it in terms of commodity fetishism in a way, but which is uh, what a lot of people have talked about in terms of how consumers are blind to the relations of production, the way commodities congeal hidden labor. But on the other hand, one could flip this question to ask about the conditions of its consumption. It's another part of the chain that's often invisible to those at the earlier parts. So I argue that in this case, for Chinese mushroom hunters and dealers, their knowledge that the mushrooms are not just going anywhere, but are going particularly to Japan, this shapes the relationships between themselves, the mushroom, the state, and, and others in particular ways. So in part, this is about the requirements and standards that are demanded by Japanese dealers, but it's something more. And this is just to, um, to place you in a general sense of here's China. Um, so right, we were just up in Beijing up there, and now, we were, now we're down in southwest China here, and particularly in Yunnan province. Um, so that's a more kind of standard map with a kind of isolated country. Here's a map I like a little more that really places it, places Yunnan within Southeast Asia, um, right? So you get to see India here. And I, I love, so up here where I was doing this collecting, I always tell people, you know, we're far closer to India than we are to Kunming, you know, than, than the capital of, uh, of the province. Here's Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam. That's the kind of sense of, of, of this world here. So as many of you know, there's, um, there's, a history of these Japanese-Chinese relations, um, and yet still Japanese colonialism is still a subject that rarely gets framed and analyzed as part of colonial studies, which remains um, almost exclusively focused on European centers. But the history of Japanese imperialism is strongly felt, taught, and even sung in contemporary China. So Japan's imperial ambitions soared during the early 1900s, invading China among with a number of other places, leading to particularly horrific events such as the rape of Nanking. And so here in southwest China, the Japanese threat was particularly acute as the uh, Japanese here, when what used to be British Burma, the Japanese were kind of running the, um, the British out, going northward, and there was quite a strong uh, a threat of Japanese invasion that way. Um, and which is still very much part of the kind of everyday landscape and um, stories. And World War II, uh, known in China as the anti-Japanese war, as Sasha mentioned, this kind of new move to kind of, to in some ways, in certain official narratives, to erase uh, the history of state socialism. I was interested to see new textbooks that talked about uh, the role of Mao Zedong, not in building socialist China from 49, you know, onward, you know, until his death, right, in 76, and, and, but about his role in uniting China against Japanese. Um, there was actually one time, uh, when I found it most uh, vocif vociferously, was in 1995, there was a National Day celebration that my wife and I went to, and there was a song competition in the university, and I saw a number of my colleagues who are often very kind of quiet and demure, but they got together to uh, come up and they had the winning song. And they, uh, at the end of it, it, it turned out, I, did, I had no idea the context, but it was an anti-Japanese song. And you know, these very kind of 
uh, very sophisticated cosmopolitan folks were staying up yelling, Shah, 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 which means kill, 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 um, at the end as part of this larger uh, sense of, of, re of remembering that um, time. Okay. So there are many ways, I think, in which this, the Chinese knowledge about the Japanese demand, as one young man um, in China told me this summer, he says, we work for Japanese stomachs. He said, it inflects their mental and physical labor. So I heard this summer that Matsutake has become the province's most important export crop. It's, it's um, well, probably with the exception of tobacco, but in terms of, of edible things. And now over 60,000 people are devoting their lives um, to this trade, at least during its seasonality. And many of the Matsutake dealers, like the woman that we saw earlier, live in these rural mountainous areas where family incomes up there have been hovering often around $150 a family a year. And so the rise of this commodity, where lucky hunters um, in some situations have been able, at the height of the, of the value, can make as much in a, you know, a week or less as they would an entire year. So I've heard many conversations about value, about demand, um, as Chinese dealers and hunters struggle to understand and explain price. And Matsutake, and I don't, I don't have the exact figures on this, but it's among the most volatile commodities in the world, and sometimes it could rise and fall 200% within 24 hours. I mean, we think of gas going up and down, but it's nothing like Matsutake. So the urban-based dealers in China are constantly on the phone to Tokyo and Kyoto, and each place, each place of... Um, of of, of bringing these mushroom in, wants different kinds of mushrooms, different sizes, shapes, configurations, packs. And they're not only listening to the prices as they're changing, sometimes, you know, hourly, but, but the dealers are also making arguments for better prices, and they're trying to make contracts for the future to offer certain kinds of qualities, certain amounts, um, into the future and asking for different kinds of prices. And so like myself and these other researchers, they're struggling to grasp Japanese demand and the theories uh, proliferate. Okay, and so one of the things they ask is why do the Japanese love it so much or, and why do they want to pay such a high price? And a lot of people um, in Yunnan were saying, well, it could not be because it's just food. It must be more than that. And there became this favorite story that I heard over and over again that was basically, that actually took us back to, you mentioned, uh, or, the, or in the photo it showed uh, U.S. Uncle Sam with the bomb. And it comes back to the bomb. And the story goes basically like this, that uh, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it just devastated the landscape, right? And it just, everything was demolished. And for years, it was just a kind of deserted wasteland. But then after a while, something came up there the first thing to grow in the middle of the blast was the matsutake. And they said, in fact, the mushroom cap, the shape of it, duplicates you know, the blast. And that the Japanese then realized its incredible capacities uh, to fight contamination, to fight pollution, uh, to fight all these things that you know, do things like cause cancer. And that must be the reason. So I heard this over and over again. Um, talking to uh, different uh, Japanese researchers, they said, you know, no, that's not at all the case. And actually, they were quite, uh, quite anxious about the, 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 the relationship between one of the favorite Matsutake gathering sites around Hiroshima and the ability of Matsutake to bioaccumulate. And so this idea that it comes out from this era, but though is really important in, in China, but um, obviously in Japan itself, it has a much longer history. And this is a Kasada print from the Edo period. And it shows uh, you know, families of the court going out to collect mushrooms. There are sumptuary laws against the consumption of matsutake if you are not a member of the court. Um, there is uh, you know, quite a lot uh, around this mushroom um, for a long, long time. But I thought it was interesting that, too, they're talking about the bomb and this question of contamination because so much of the tension between China and Japan around the matsutake and what compels people to make this bag and to give it out for free by the thousands and to try to compel people with new rules is fear about contamination, and in particular about pesticides. And so this bag attests to that fear. And so for the pickers in Yunnan, they're constantly worried that in Japan, the customs agents will find pesticide on a shipment. And it's happened before where just you know, even a few mushrooms are considered contaminated and the whole trade is shut down. 
thousands of pounds of the Matsutake rot. Everything comes to a grinding halt. There's no more uh, market. And so this is interesting, too, because some of the Chinese dealers are suspicious about these claims. And they argue that because Japan is no longer reliant on China, but in fact, as you saw, they get mushrooms from all around the world, they can claim contamination as a way to manipulate global markets. And this is, again, one of these things that we can't find out you know, how this really works. But nonetheless, um, irregardless, there are massive protocols in place to deal with this issue. Um, and one of the recent phenomena has been the installation, the importation from Germany of these huge chemical detection machines. And these are now in these sites of the major exporters. And it costs quite a lot of money to have one of these. But it becomes a place then where the mushrooms, millions and millions of mushrooms every week or every month during the season, are funneled through what Latour calls uh, obligatory passage points. And through some exporters, they are you know, kind of periodically sampled for pesticide contamination. So this brings us to the larger question of standards. And Japanese standards for purity have now been established. And scholars have really been interested in standards, how they're embodied in these simple numbers, but they often play an unacknowledged role in restructuring social relations of production and distribution of commodities. So in this case, the standards are in how many parts per million of contamination are acceptable. But Chinese dealers have challenged these standards on two grounds. So first one is they say that Within Japan, the Matsutake is considered a wild good as a forest-dwelling thing that should be pure. OK, thank you. And uh, all right. And then it, you know, conversely, you know, the domesticated crops like green onions, the standards are much, much uh, lower. And secondly, uh, something that I'm kind of more interested in uh, is that they say that while standards should be about the universal um, and about consistency, that Chinese matsutake are held to higher standards of purity than other countries. Okay, so Japanese suspicion of Chinese contamination then leads to create the ironic dilemma of crafting nationally specific numbers for a, supposedly what it should be in other ways, a universal standard. Okay, okay. So I'll talk uh, a little bit more briefly than I had planned about this, but another way to think about to these, uh, these relationships, and this is Yunnan, and this is, I was up here in, in the Northwest, is to think about something that, um, and here are the rules about uh, the, the bag, and you see uh, the only thing that's really named as not uh, being put in the bag is pesticide. It, are these attempts to kind of reformulate the relationship of these, these are uh, mushroom uh, hunters, pickers, kind of waiting for the boss uh, to arrive. Okay, here's another. Often sometimes waiting alongside the road. Uh, so they don't yet have the bag. They have these plastic <laughs> bags. And, they, and these women have often got up uh, before dawn, gone up and, and walked um, all day. And in the middle of the afternoon, come back and wait for these dealers. So one way to think about this, too, uh, just briefly, is I really like the, the point about the, about global indigeneities and how not just thinking about what are kind of existing national boundaries, but looking at the relationships between these groups. And uh, just very briefly, a lot of these are uh, Tibetan-speaking um, folks living up in these areas. And the, the incredible uh, move of Matsutake wealth has reconfigured relationships between the dominant ethnic Han majority and the ethnic Tibetans who have often been thought of uh, as kind of resistant to the market, uh, as, as lazy, as, as kind of uh, incapable in these kind of market transitions. But uh, uh, one of the new uh, phenomena that's come up now are what some people are calling Matsutake mansions, these giant, I mean, look at the scale of the people there, um, incredibly carved uh, 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 houses and this kind of resurgence, but something that um, actually that Cole said uh, earlier that the language of the re, I think, is inadequate to understand these dynamics. So it, as much as it often refers to tradition as recovered or recuperated, but we really see something new afoot um, in the transformation of the wealth, economy, and global circulation um, that may help form these emerging social worlds and that link producers and consumers in connected and yet in distinct ways. Myself. We are running out of time. 
All right, I am really honored and excited to be part of this initiative and especially this panel. Um, for me, objects and commodities have incredible ped pedagogical but also epistemological potential. As our speakers have highlighted here and each in their own way, uh, through dreamscapes, salmon, and mushrooms, uh, co commodities or objects are sites of encounter. And one of the reasons that I get so excited about this notion of sites and com uh, sites of encounter is that um, it, they allow us to avoid the spatial trappings that are engendered by hierarchical models of scale. So I'm a geographer. I'm going to give the geography spiel here. So we can think of these hierarchical models of scale like the Russian dolls, right? So the local is always small, and it's enveloped, right, in a series of other scales, regional, national, global. And there are a number of problematic uh, implications of this kind of framing of scale, and I'm only going to talk about one, which is that the local in this model is almost always feminized, right, as passive um, and as vulnerable to penetration by the global or the national. Um, and then conversely, the global is masculinized as ever powerful and penetrating. And the speakers that we've heard today avoid these kinds of reifications, I think, by focusing on objects and commodities and the sites of encounter that they engender. And here's another sort of geographical kind of concept. I think thinking about these sites of encounter allow us to forward what geographers like to call a flat ontology. And a flat ontology keeps us close to bodies and beings and objects and the practices that act in relation to make the world. And I was excited that a number, or I think all three of you, spoke about making worlds, worlding practices, right? Um, one of the things that I really like about uh, the notion of a flat ontology is that it helps us to recognize our world-making practices as more than human. And in the stories that we've heard today, humans aren't the only actors, right? We humans act in relation to and with many other beings and objects, objects that we consider to be inert, right? Living beings as well. Um, indeed, our very subjectivities are constituted in and through other beings and objects. And I think we've seen this really powerfully in the presentations today. And I'm just going to talk just a tiny bit, because I really want to share some of these images with you uh, from my own work in the US-Mexico borderlands about how these kinds of objects are so integral to our identity-making practices. And I'm going to talk about um, the ways in which, or the, the sort of background of the story is the ways in which undocumented migrants who want to enter the United States, the majority today walk through vast, uninhabited uh, spaces like the, the Sonora Desert. And of course, to walk through these kinds of spaces uh, in journeys that take three, four, five, sometimes six days, of course they have to carry lots of things with them. Um, and the obvious things would be water bottles, right? Um, food. Um, but they also carry all kinds of personal items. Obvious ones would be medicine. Less obvious would be makeup, but we find a lot of that out in the desert. Uh, clothes, books, tarot cards. Um, one of the things we find a lot are these hand-embroidered cloths, and these are things that are given to an undocumented, well, given to a person as they embark upon this trajectory of, of becoming an undocumented migrant. And many of them say very sentimental messages like, you know, love is forever, or the mother is everything, or something like this. Um, these kinds of objects have generated a great deal of controversy in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. And various ID cards, of course, are another thing that people have to carry or choose to carry. Um, in the borderlands, anti-immigrant groups um, enlist these 
objects, which they transfigure as trash, um, to blame undocumented immigrants for trashing the United States. So that becomes a really interesting metaphor that arises out of the materiality of these practices. Uh, for humanitarian groups, um, the objects allow for experiences of intimate encounter, right, where they take volunteers out to pick up the trash, but in the process of picking things up, people become very intimately involved with the things that they find, and that evokes a transformation for many of them uh, in their ideas about uh, what it means uh, to be an undocumented migrant. And so one of the things I find interesting about these objects is the way that they are integral to what I call quotidian geopolitical identities, right? The ways people like you and me uh, think of ourselves in relation to others or how we might contest kind of larger um, scale ideas. Um, the objects are also used in another major element of um, migrant journeys, and this is kind of the, the religiosity of those journeys. And um, migrants carry prayer cards and candles and a lot of other kinds of sacred objects. Um, and in the process of walking, they've created a number of shrines throughout the borderlands. And one thing that we don't really understand is if people already know that the shrines are there and they're carrying those kinds of things, especially candles, uh, to place them at these shrines, or if they are carrying those objects for their own reasons and then come across a shrine and deposit that for reasons of, of saying a prayer or something like this. Um, this is just another shrine that's actually on the Tohono O'odham Nation, and uh, it's a shrine to, the, to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, so the, the sort of question I want to leave you with is this. Uh, how might a recognition of relational ontologies radically transform Eurocentric understanding of social relations? In other words, how might what some of us call post-humanist ontologies work towards a decolonizing of the humanities and the social sciences? And I say decolonizing because of the ways in which dualist ontologies that presume a human and non-human split are in no way universal, right? And yet are deployed by many of us in our work in ways that I think, and I would argue, are part of a further colonizing project in the way that they perpetuate that dualism that is in no way universal. So I, I really wanted to speak about this because of Tirso's talking about the seed, right? What would it mean to recognize the seed as a living being or the objects in this museum uh, that we are surrounded with, right, um, as alive, as not inert, right, but as beings or entities that are alive in organizing and bringing together social relations on a whole number of, of sort of sacred, material, and physical levels. Thank you. So what do we want to do about questions? <laughs> different uh, situation and um, but it was in my mind that the idea of sterilization and and then she made a note with your presentation with the architectural presentation because it kind of went from a, a, a what what 
I would view individually as a quite a rich, cultural, old, beautiful place. And, and I think you must have felt the same way because she's like, sterile, there you go again. And then, and then when you were talking about the fish, I was actually saying to Jill, oh, well, we do that like every step of the way, the fish has to be perfect, like what Shawnee was talking about. It took me a long time to get your point because I was all about, yes, the fish must look good from beginning to end. And then I went, wow, sterile fish. And, and then even in the, in the mushrooms, it's the same thing, but you know, I don't mind not having pesticides. <laughs> but it, was, it seems that when you, when you are providing outside of your, maybe your even what would be considered a regular bounds uh, or boundary for, eco for economics, it, you lose the quintessential like being. Respond really quickly because we were actually talking uh, bef before the panel about how that idea of sort of the stripping away being like the. Okay, uh, well, I have a little bit of business to take care of. Um, fortunately, f fortunately, we are. Uh, we are out of, out of time, which relieves me of a tremendous burden that has been growing <laughs> deep inside my soul since about two and a half days ago, uh, which is what to do about this. <laughs> and as I was sitting here just, just thinking about it um, and how uh, often at the ends of conferences, especially the kinds of cartographic conferences that I um, have gone to in the past, uh, somebody stands up here and says, well, actually I should say not somebody, but in particular the late David Woodward. Um, many of you uh, know his work or knew him. And he would say, well, the way that I'm going to resolve these concluding remarks is by making a map. And he would sort of tie all of the different elements of the talks together sort of through spatial, spatial language. And I was thinking that certainly that's one way of approaching a kind of um, kaleidoscope like this, because it seems to me it is a little bit of a kaleidoscope. But that the, um, the idea of itineraries is actually what I've been thinking about that term, I think, over the course of the last um, few days quite a bit, and, and even long before that. And what it seems to me that's interesting about itineraries as a, as a, as a notion is that um, it's, a, it's an extraordinarily schematic term. I mean, when you think about an itinerary, a travel itinerary, it just shows you know, the place you're leaving from and the place that you're arriving to. It doesn't tell you anything about what's going to happen in between. And I think that it's precisely the power of that schematic nature that has allowed all of us and that allows the term, I think, to, you know, for us to fill in precisely whatever moment we feel and we observe as being operative within this much longer itinerary. Moments, pivots, um, movements outside, um, inside, et cetera. And one of, the, one of the things that I, when I was sort of thinking about terms, uh, the, con the, the idea for this symposium predated the imagination of a, of a, of a title for it. And one of the things that I was thinking about is precisely Mary Louise Pratt's idea about contact zones, zones of contacts. And it struck me as odd that um, that, that term, which is extraordinarily vague, um, still has a tremendous amount of purchase within the um, people whose concerns are uh, global encounters and such. And um, Florence was talking about second or third order zones. And I thought to myself, well, well what's, what's wonderful about the idea of the itinerary is we don't have to settle on one, wh where these zones are. Every place can be a particular zone of encounter, whether it's that initial encounter, which we realize is many different encounters sort of added up and arrived at at one moment, or whether it's a third kind of order encounter that takes place in a completely different different location. So I think that I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that um, this notion of itineraries seems to have, um, to have been useful and productive. I'm also heartened by the fact that my, um, what some people have called interventionist uh, 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 strategy, um, has, um, has yielded extra an extraordinary 
um, effort, I think, on the part of all of the participants here. Um, and I must congratulate each and every one of you for having really risen to the occasion of what this meeting is all about. For me, and I've participated, as I'm sure many of you have, in interdisciplinary gatherings, this has been the one where the disciplinarity has, uh, has, has diminished, has, has, been, has been least present, I think, and the attachment to interrogating the questions of what happens when cultures intersect and interrelate has been more paramount. And I really think it's a tribute to how um, seriously you took um, the suggestions, instructions, commands uh, that, that I gave you, um, but also the incredible dynamic uh, nature of all of your um, research. I think that it would be hard to, um, to leave this gathering over the past few days um, only thinking within a particular disciplinary frame. Let's see if I can find, I do have some people to thank and then I want to just end with um, a very short anecdote from my, uh, from my own research because that was one of the other sensations that's been growing in me has been this desire to share what I work on with all of you. <laughs> But I wisely resisted that temptation and um, planned, planned dinner instead, <laughs> although not salmon. Uh, this, e this initiative emerged through the generosity of the students of UBC, uh, through the Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund that I referenced earlier, that I think the university in its wisdom gives back to the faculty here at UBC 1% of student fees for initiatives that are designed to enhance the instructional and research environments of this campus. I think it's a really wonderful model that yields all kinds of different projects, and this one um, fits, if loosely, um, within it. The Dean's Office of the Faculty of Arts uh, was very supportive of this project, as was the Irving K. Barber Learning Center, which is a kind of alternate library on this campus, very recently constructed. It was one of the few places on this campus we didn't hold uh, an event, um, but they were quite, um, and actually I must say they are the ones who are sponsoring the webcasting, paying for it entirely, and I was also grateful for that because there were so many moments that I heard people say things, and I was so disorganized I couldn't even figure out where I was going to write it down. So um, I'm really looking forward to having this um, archived. It'll be part of the Barber Center and the Global Encounters um, website as well. St. John's College, the Peter Wall Institute, of course the Museum of Anthropology, um, and the Department of History were all key um, financial and sort of broader support for this symposium. Uh, the Department of Anthropology, the Department of Asian Studies, Department of English, the Dutch Studies Endowment. I was glad to see that the Dutch were well represented by those that I invited. Um, and, and even Sanjay managed to bring the Dutch into his uh, discussion unprompted. The Department of Sociology, the First Nations Studies Program, and the Program in Law and Society also donated um, for our collective efforts. I also want to thank, um, in particular, several individuals who really have helped this project to sort of take, take shape over the past year. Catherine Callsbeek and Sarah Romke of the Rare Books and Special Collections have been really wonderful collaborators with me. They couldn't attend a lot of these sessions, but they have helped to bring some of the resources of UBC onto the website, and I hope that you'll have a chance over time to take a look at some of those materials as well. I'd like to thank the students Bronwyn Malloy and Daryl Jansen for um, helping out with the logistics of this operation and helping things run smoothly. Uh, Jill Baird, I thanked earlier, um, but uh, can't, I, it does not at all hurt to thank her again, as well as Jennifer Robinson, um, Jill's assistant. You both have been fantastic, and this has been a super pleasure to work with you on this. Um, and also the staffs of, respectively, the Longhouse, St. John's College, the Peter Wall Institute, and the Belkin Gallery, where this all began. Most of all, I think, I want to thank the participants um, 
And by participants, I also mean the broader, all of you who have um, participated sort of indirectly or directly by being present here. I'm thrilled to have colleagues from Un uh, University of Washington here to meet, uh, to meet other, other colleagues in similar areas and different areas. And I hope that this will be the beginning of many other collaborations. Uh, the other British Columbia institutions, SFU, University of Victoria, UBC, Okanagan, um, these, are, these are, we should all be collaborating much more often. Um, I was, I'm very, very happy and want to thank again Larry Grant, Nika Collison, and Shawnee Cassavant for coming from your respective communities and sharing your wisdom and, um, and knowledge with us. It's a, that has been for me a particular in, a, a pleasure and inspiration, and I think I was I was very pleased to hear that echoed in some of these later um, later uh, presentations, reminding us of where we started two and a half days ago. And finally, um, my colleagues at UBC uh, from the departments of anthropology, sociology, geography, art history colleagues from history, both who participated and those who have attended this political science. Um, this is really uh, the idea that a university exists as an interdisciplinary space and we don't talk to one another is, I think, criminal. And so I think we have to, there's a reason why the, can the buildings are as close together on a university campus as they are. Um, so we shouldn't let um, these other crazy disciplinary boundaries interfere with that. Okay. I'm going to end by bringing us to the late 18th century Amazon, an expedition that was launched by the Portuguese uh, government to reconnoiter a space, um, the, the Amazon basin, that they felt and hoped would be a, an, an area of increased economic benefit to the crown through agricultural specimens in particular, but also through understanding at a deeper level who the different subject populations were that inhabited the region. This is a, an image from that expedition. Some of you may be familiar. The expedition's um, sort of chief, uh, chief traveler was a man by the name of Alexandre Rodriguez Ferreira. He um, spent about 10 years in the Amazon basin. He brought with him sketch artists um, uh, like the one who did this particular image of a um, couple of Indians um, from the Rio Branco region um, north of the Amazon River. And in addition to being in interested in the kind of products that the Amazon basin could offer, the um, uh, Fejera was also quite interested in the spatial aptitudes of the native populations. And he collected various kinds of information about their property, practices, their ter different forms of territoriality and such. But I became fascinated when I was reading Fejera's accounts of a particular moment that he recounts where he witnesses a, a um, actually, well, it's very interesting because he is normally puts himself in the, in the role of ethnographer. And in this particular situation, he describes, a, um, as he is making a map of the region, that a Makushi Indian from this Rio Branco region is actually in his hut observing him as he is making um, the map. Paying very close attention to what Fejera had been working on, the Indian decided to reproduce in the sand what the, the graphic representation made by his European counterpart, and I quote Fejera. Without a single word, the Makushi snatched the stick that I keep in the corner of my tent with the point, and with the point, began sketching on the sandy floor a linked series of large and small rivers. At the Araru Falls, he sketched in the fortress of San Joaquin, and a number of squares that represented the tents which had been annexed as part of the fort. Taking advantage of the moment, I offered him paper and invited him to create with pen and ink what up till then he had made with a stick alone. Without hesitation, he began sketching a map, 
where the mountain ranges were marked by a successive series of more or less sharp angles, and the Indian's hut, malocas, by large and small circles. Adding nothing other than the names he had told to me, I showed the map to His Excellency, uh, Senor Juan Pereira Caldas, governor of the captaincy of Rio Negro, to the astronomer Jose Simões de Carvalho, and many others. There's much about this ephemeral map that we can, that we can um, discuss. Uh, its transformation from a written population map describing peoples and places into an ephemeral representation with a stick, and from that sand map back into a European medium of ink on paper constructed by an Amerindian reaffirms what I think we've seen in many of the presentations, which is the slippery nature of material representations and the transformations that these different um, objects undergo. But I think it also really speaks to the fact um, and, in, and in fact, this is a map that was made by Jose Simões de Carvalho. And I bring attention to this particular region here, where you see these three terms, Tebai, Tawana, and Kawapushi, which in a sense are sitting um, without any correlated geographical, uh, geographical attribute or um, occurrence. That is to say, they are hanging there um, and could arguably are ethnonyms, that is the, the names of indigenous populations that could have been provided precisely from the kind of ephemeral representation that we have here in this image. And as I was thinking about ways and metaphors for what has taken place over the last two and a half days, I thought that um, what, I, what I'm hopeful for is that the kinds of exchanges that we have had um, will appear, perhaps in not immediately visible ways, but at, some, at a deeper level within um, each other's work, um, and um, perhaps with a keen eye, we'll all be aware of the ways that our work has been interest, influenced by the interactions that we've had here, and, um, and by the experiences that all of you have brought to uh, this meeting over the past few days. So I think I'll end. Um, I also want to say, um, and this is a, as, a, as a sort of a nod and an introduction to our uh, closing speaker, which is that um, exchange, which is the term, one of the terms that we haven't really discussed very much, but that has a tremendously long genealogy within anthropology in particular, is not always a kind of a reciprocal and a, um, a quid pro quo sort of, uh, sort of thing, and that there are, that there are kinds of knowledges um, that, have, that, are purport, that are purposely kept um, within the confines of a particular culture and a particular community. And um, at the same, at one, on one hand, it's important to respect the, um, that knowledge that is within this community. On the other hand, I think that the last few days have really shown us how incredibly, not only valuable it is, but is essential to step outside of our own parochial interests and to learn from people, whether they're working at a local or on a global scale, of um, the kinds of different interactions that can take place. So with that, I think we can probably take two minutes to stand up, stretch our legs, and call Tayake Alfred to uh, join us. I don't think he's in here yet. Yeah.